Sir. What's I have to I have to stop you with the camera because oh. I can see you. So do me a favor. <laughs> don't pull it out again. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. What was he doing? Recording. Oh. Um. Sir, sir, I'm doing a show that's on television. I'm being recorded all day long, but don't you record. I'm going to make a whole thing about it. I'm Dave Rubin. This is The Rubin Report. It's March 28th, 2024. We're live streaming on Rumble, YouTube, and Locals. And no, contrary to the conspiracy theorists out there, we have no evidence to believe that it was big tech who took us out yesterday. Yes, all of you guys were watching yesterday and our stream dropped at I think about 16 minutes in. And apparently I was talking about big tech or something and people started freaking out. I saw comment sections after, my God, they went for it. It does sound like we had a local outage here. There's been a lot of storms in Miami lately. Anyway, we will see if the stream remains up today. Uh, there will be no post-game show today, however, because I got a gajillion meetings uh, to deal with. Uh, but if you do want to jump over and support us on Locals, it is rubenreport.locals. Dot com, and we have a Ruben Report community Q&A for you today. And I just want to hit a couple of videos up top related to white guilt and colonization and all of the rich people who just want to sit around and destroy this country. And there's an awful lot of them. That's what we're going to be doing. And then your questions on the other side. But before we do that, let me talk to you guys about Start Mail. Guys, we all use our email in our daily lives. It's how we communicate, work, and even manage our personal affairs. Even with social media and messenger apps, email remains an essential communication tool. But is it private? Not as much as you'd think. Email wasn't designed with privacy in mind, yet we use it for everything. Work, personal life, signing up for services like websites. It's become a core part of our digital identity. We can't just get rid of it, but how can we make it more secure? By choosing a secure email provider like Startmail. Startmail ensures that your email remains private. Unlike services like Gmail or Yahoo, Startmail doesn't use your data for targeted ads. It's strictly ad and tracking free. It's, it's a strictly ad and tracking free service that doesn't share your data with third parties. Plus, it comes with unlimited disposable email addresses to protect you from phishing scams and hacking attempts. Worried about the hassle of switching? Startmail has got you covered. With their easy migration tool, you can move your emails and contacts from Gmail, Outlook, Yahoo, and more with a couple clicks. No technical knowledge required. Switch to Startmail and experience the peace of mind that comes with a truly secure email service. Sign up today to save 50% on your first subscription year. Go to startmail.com slash Dave and join millions of people who are moving away from big tech to secure email providers. That's startmail with a T dot com slash Dave. And now back to me. Okay, so we put together just a couple interesting videos of what is sort of working through the system. You know, on yesterday's show, we talked about some of the good signs, and there are some good signs happening in the country right now as people wake up to a lot of the political and media BS and all that stuff. Uh, but of course, what uh, sits with people waking up is that a whole lot of people have been in a slumber for a long time. And one of the reasons they've been in a slumber for a long time is that the left and the wokesters, they have infected our places of education, particularly higher education, but it's really across the board. So this video is about 45 seconds long. Uh, has been making the rounds. It's from a recent TED talk. This is a teacher and no joke about this. It's unclear to me whether this is a dude or a chick or a little bit of both, who knows, uh, explaining uh, a bit of something about colonial violence and really directing it at the people in the crowd. Enjoy. I think that focusing still on the people who are uncomfortable about this it's still recreating colonial violence. It's still cre recreating cis supremacy. It's still recreating uh, able supremacy. It's still recreating white supremacy. So instead, I'm gonna do what I usually do when I talk my classes, is I try to weaponize everybody in there. I try to talk to them about what is colonialism, how do we interact with it, how do we engage with it, and how do we combat it within ourselves, within our families, within our communities, and how do we take that further? What is colonial violence? And it's something that is like really easy to like frame in the past. It's something that's really easy to frame as something that we don't participate in. But really, colonial violence is sitting in these seats right now and being comfortable. Colonial violence is the control of the elements that we have and being warm in this room. All right. The reason I wanted to show you this clip, because we're going to connect it to some other stuff, but this, this general notion that people show up to TED Talks, in the day, you, you, back in the day, you would show up to a TED Talk and you would learn about something. You might learn about what the 
frontier of AI is how that's about to change us. So you might learn about uh, new ways that people can get off drugs or new therapies or all sorts of stuff, new, new ways of thinking about building civilizations and cities and all this stuff. And now they're doing TED Talks with people from completely nonsensical um, verticals in education. Like this is just all nonsense, cis supremacy, white supremacy, ableist supremacy. And, and then they go there and I think they pay usually to go to a TED Talk to have someone, it's a guy or a girl, it doesn't matter, tell them that they're basically white supremacists because they're sitting there comfortably in their chairs and that there's a, there is a disease. I mean, this is why wokeness is a mind virus, that people do that and then they, they're being told they're white supremacists and they're ableist supremacists and they applaud it. And, and I think that that disease is deeply connected to a bunch of people, it deeply connected to, to a society that kind of doesn't know what it believes anymore. So if, if a society doesn't know what it believes and what it stands for, then it will basically fall for everything. And unfortunately, in Western societies, we've become so wealthy, we've become so modernized in so many ways that now we are quite literally committing Harry Carry on ourselves. We're impaling ourselves on these bad ideas. Uh, check out this. This is Joe Rogan with comedians Dave Attell and Ian, uh, is it Ian LaDance? Ian Fidance on how uh, the woke ideology, how it guilts rich people into basically destroying the country they live in. There was a lot of rich kids that were involved. <laughs> of course. Yeah. It's always rich kids. Yeah. yeah. Because those are the kids that have the luxury of being able to go out and protest and do well, stuff like this. I think like it's this. like inherent guilt, too, oh, of yeah. like, God, I feel so bad. What can I do? 100%, especially today. Today yeah. you're being told that just by virtue of the color of your skin, you're a colonizer. Yeah. You're, you're responsible for everything. And mm. there's people like, some of these people that are in these uh, protests, they haven't thought shit out at all. No. So they get confronted by uh, influencers, right? And they ask them like real simple questions to get them riled up. Like, what do you think we should do? We need to like give it to this yeah. country. Capitalism. We're you don't understand. We're yeah. trying to dissolve the country. Dis get That's away what... from the capitals. Get yep. away from the capital. Like yeah. what? But you guys can see what happens here. People like in that previous video, teach young people to feel guilt and confused about everything and think that America was founded on white supremacy and ableist supremacy and the rest of it. And then you have these kids who then march in protests, whether it's BLM protests or Antifa protests or Hamas protests, and they're all basically the same thing with different wrapping around them, right? Different packaging. And they wanna destroy the country, the country which has allowed them uh, and afforded them all of the freedoms that are the, that are the world's jealousy, that generations before them had to give their lives and blood for so that they could be free, so that they could then be burning down buildings in the name of tolerance and diversity. But I wanna connect this a little bit to sort of what's happening globally right now because you know we're having this huge problem at our border uh, and the president of Mexico is making the rounds on American TV right now and uh, he wants us to pay up. He wants us, America, to pay up to solve those root causes of the border crisis and he has a number in mind actually. With the ear of the White House, President Lopez Obrador proposed his fix that the United States commit $20 billion a year to poor countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, lift sanctions on Venezuela, end the Cuban embargo, and legalize millions of law-abiding Mexicans living in the U.S. If they don't do the things that you've said need to be done, then what? The flow of migrants will continue. Your critics have said what you're doing or what you're asking for to help secure the border is diplomatic blackmail. What do you say? I'm speaking frankly. We have to say things as they are. And I always say what I feel. I always say what I think. It is diplomatic blackmail. Uh, the president of the country that's to our south, that basically has the open border, is basically like, give us 20 billion for, whatever, okay, Venezuela, Cuba, blah, blah, blah. We want 20 billion, these four countries. Otherwise, we'll just keep sending people. And the thing is, he knows that we, as long as we have an American administration, ain't gonna do jack shit to stop these people. So that does kind of sound like a threat. And now I wanna show you one other clip of him because if you really wanna get what's going on here, uh, there is a movement to figure out how to destroy the United, States, the United States of America. You don't need to destroy the United States of America in the ways that we used to think that you would destroy countries. Oh, you can blow a country apart, you can kill everybody, right? You don't really have to do that anymore. There are ways 
through importing drugs, through importing crime, through importing bad ideas, general mayhem, get a bunch of progressives in charge who don't defend laws, that you could basically destabilize a whole country. And there are uh, a couple ways to protect against that. Some of those ways have to do with traditions and values and things of that nature. Uh, and uh, listen to his diagnosis of the problem here in America. The DEA says cartels are mass producing fentanyl and the U.S. State Department has said that most of it is coming out of Mexico. Are they wrong? T. Yes. Oh, no. Or rather, they don't have all the information, because fentanyl is also produced in the United States. The State Department says most of it's coming from Mexico. Fentanyl is produced in the United States, in Canada, and in Mexico, and the chemical precursors come from Asia. You know why we don't have the drug consumption that you have in the United States? Because we have customs, traditions, and we don't have the problem of the disintegration of the family. Isn't that something? On one hand, he's telling us, take all these people in and pay us, otherwise we'll keep sending the people in. And then he's saying, but we have something in our country. Our country, we still have a culture. We still have a language. We still have a certain set of values. We have types of food. We have things that tie us together. Now, America has had that for 200 plus years. We've had the melting pot. Our culture was a culture of freedom. It was actually the most uh, magical culture of all, probably in human history, because it said everyone could be part of it. Uh, but now, because of the woke, because of the importation of all sorts of people who believe all sorts of things that are counter to American values, it's all sort of fraying. And he's telling us that. He's basically saying, yeah, we're going to be okay here in Mexico because we're just going to flood you with people. And by the way, you don't even have the proper defenses to defend your country. So perhaps ladies and gentlemen, we should start thinking about those things that unite us. We should start looking back on our founding documents maybe. We should start understanding that a culture of freedom actually is enough, that defending God-given rights is enough, and that it is good and it has been good, and we better not freaking give it away because it will be much worse on the other side. That is a fine segue, as I have scared the shit out of you, to uh, our next ad, which is for Relaxium. Guys, attention to all of you who are sleep deprived. If you stay in sleep debt and want a solution to your sleepless nights and hard to get through days, look no further than Relaxium Sleep, America's number one trusted sleep aid. Clinical neurologist, Dr. Eric Chilabidi, formulated this innovative drug-free blend of natural ingredients, including the exclusive Valorist blend that relaxes both the mind and body for peaceful nights deep sleep. Medical experts tell us chronic sleep deprivation has severe consequences impacting cognitive function, mood, and overall health. Adequate and consistent sleep is crucial for optimal well-being and daily functioning. Seriously, my friends, if you're struggling with sleep, then you owe it to yourself to try Relaxium Sleep risk-free like tens of thousands of Americans that no longer suffer and now falling asleep faster, staying asleep longer, and waking up refreshed every day. And the best part is for you, Relaxium Sleep is offering a full-size bottle to try risk-free for 30 nights, plus free shipping at less than a dollar a night. That's over 60% savings. Love it or your money back guarantee. Click the link below or visit relaxium.com slash Ruben. And now back to me. All right, let's get to a rubenreport.locals.com community Q&A. Here we go. SG says, hey, Dave, the name for the list mentioned on Monday writes itself, the lemon list. What he's referring to here, if you didn't see the show on Monday, I said that we're just not going to talk about Don Lemon anymore. Like it was enough last week. I think we did it. Let the guy slide into irrelevancy and we should come up with a list of people that once we've just done everything we could do to them, it's once it's gotten to its grotesque volition, we can just put them on a list and they're just never going to be discussed again. Don Lemon, well, I guess I'm discussing Don Lemon right now because we haven't figured out the name of the list yet. But that was the purpose of all this. So you're, you want to call it the lemon list. And your reasoning is, one, it's named for its inaugural member. And two, the word lemon also connotes a useless piece of non-functional junk. So there's that. You should also start an award called the lemony, like the Razzie. Each month, you can nominate several possible recipients and the community can vote on the winner. At the end of the year, we can vote on the 12 monthly winners to see who will win the lemony of the year. My gift to you, but don't forget when the merch starts selling. Uh, thanks, love the show. I'm Yisrael Chai. Well, 
That is a great idea. So we're gonna call it the lemon list, I love that. And once a month we will pick who is the, the uh, official winner of the lemon list for that month. And you're right, we will then compile those 12 people and at the end of the year, give the award very publicly to somebody who then will not be discussed on this show in 2025. I like the way you think. Bonnie says, I remember back in the 1990s hearing pundits and politicians saying how Islam could not assimilate into our country because Sharia law goes directly against our constitution. We're seeing the effects of that now, even with Ilhan Omar and company in Congress. Do you think it's possible to integrate two cultures slash religions, especially when one of them think you should convert to their way of thinking or to their way of thinking or die. Of course, I'm not saying all Muslims think this way. Well, first off, you absolutely can bring different cultures and religions together and live largely in peace. The United States has been doing that again, as I always say, better than anybody for 200 plus years. There are many countries uh, where different cultures, different religions, different people, all of that stuff works. Now, there is a problem, I would say, with political Islam in that, first off, on the religious side, you know, there's a difference between a religion that wants people to convert and a religion that just wants people to be left alone. So when people always say, well, all, all you know, the monotheistic religions, they're all equally bad. That's what, you know, like a, let's say a more secular atheist would say. It's like, well, you might think they're all bad, but they can't all be equally as bad and they can't all be as equally as good because by definition, they're different. They have a different set of beliefs and all of that. So Judaism, for example, doesn't convert people. And that's why there's not a lot of Jews. Uh, it's not, they're not proselytizing to other people. Islam wants people to come in. There are various denominations of Christianity. Some want more people to convert, say evangelicals. Some are a little, uh, not, not as forward with that, let's say. Um, so the, the question, can, can political Islam basically exist with the West? That's really what I'm sort of garnering your question to mean. <sighs> I don't know that there's any evidence of it. I mean, again, I always say it's like the people in Britain who are now watching Hamas supporters and ISIS supporters and everything else march through their streets. It's like, if they could have done something about this 20 years ago, I think they might have they might have done it. And maybe it's too late now. I think France has a problem with that, Belgium, Germany, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have a, a major problem with it in America, at least yet, because we've done a much better job with integrating people. And you can be uh, anything you want to be in the United States, regardless of your religion. but. There is a, di there, there just fundamentally is, this is not racist to say or, or anything else. And by the way, there's a difference between a race and a religion. Um, but where political Islam takes root, it's not, certainly not good for Jews and it's not good for Christians. Just look at every country where it exists. And actually it's not good for say liberal Muslims or people or women or gays, et cetera, et cetera. These are just realities and we should just know them to be realities. Uh, Amy says, now that you've seen the 47 minute video that Israel has gathered to document the Hamas massacre, do you feel that it should somehow be made available to the wider public? I don't know. I had many discussions with people about this in Israel from political people to, to just people on the street. Uh, I've talked about it with an awful lot of people since I've been back. Um, for all the horrible things that you all saw, like it's worse, like to watch someone slowly be beheaded with what in effect looks like a kitchen knife, slowly be beheaded while the guy's like smiling and laughing and then just pick up the head and walk away. That's what I saw. Um, the, the, the worst thing was the um, father grabbing his two young kids who were probably five and seven or something like that. And he runs them into the bomb shelter and the Hamas guy just casually walks in, drops the grenade. You see the body of the father blown apart, body just dropped. The kids run out screaming. And then you, there's a video of the kids talking in the kitchen as they're hiding, trying to figure out if, if it was even real what just happened. Kid's eye is, is completely blown off. They, apparently they're alive. Uh, we were told by the IDF representative that they're not showing it because out of respect to some of the families, because obviously these are the last images, a lot of these people, um, you see piles of women, just piles of women on top of each other. Um, with they, they zoom in and you can see that there's blood obviously in, in uh, the genital region. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is because you wanna respect these people, the family's wishes and all of those things, and they don't want maybe that to be the last image of their son or daughter or cousin or mother uh, that got out there. And on the other hand, there are obviously a set of people that either don't believe these things happen or anything else, but there's so much video evidence that's out there now, like plenty of it, thank, thankfully, mostly because of Twitter. 
where people have seen this and they still don't believe it. So I don't know what the answer is to that. I just don't know. Uh, the Eurasian says, isn't saying rising car thefts are the fault of car companies for making them too attractive slash easy to steal, like saying women who dress sexy are blamed to are to blame if they get raped. Why are criminals always let off the hook? So what you're referencing is a video I showed you, I think two days ago, of Attorney General of Minnesota, um, Keith Ellison, who's really just an absolutely awful, progressive whack job. And he's basically suing two car companies for making their cars too easy to break into. The implication being, oh, it's just, you're, you're tempting these young kids as if that's the real issue, as opposed to teaching kids that, I don't know, maybe stealing is bad, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, it is the exact same thing. I should have said that on the show the other day. It's basically saying to a woman, oh, you wore uh, an off the shoulder dress and you took a walk at 9 p.m. at night alone. Like, of course you should have got raped. It's like, no, it's not the fault of the woman for going out at night or how she dressed, it's the fault of the person who raped her. But this is what they do with everything. The, the progressives never address the bad people or the problem. They blame the good law-abiding people uh, for the things, for, for all of society's issues. And it's not good. Glow says, Dave, do you listen to any other podcast or pundit on a daily or near daily basis? Is there any other podcast or a pundit that you find yourself eager to hear from when big news breaks? You know, I don't listen. There's no show that I listen to like from the beginning to end every day. I just simply don't have time. Obviously we cover a lot here. I would say, you know, when, when Phoenix and I are going through the show in the morning, you know, I have sent him usually a ton of clips that, that I'm churning through throughout Twitter during the day. So I'm seeing bites from everybody. Sometimes he sends me things back that I haven't seen before from different podcasts or whatever. And I feel like through that, I have a pretty good handle on what's going on. I, to some extent, I wish I had more time for some of that. Um, but in the few moments that I have a little bit of time to do some cardio or even take a walk, like if I'm taking a walk with Clyde and the kids, then I want to be completely off the grid. If I'm doing cardio, like I want to watch basketball or just not, or just listen to music or something. I, I don't want to be in, in the matrix to that extent. I do, the only one that I try to listen to like a little bit more really, and this will come as no shock to any of you, are, are Jordan Peterson, uh, particularly his interviews. Um, you know, he never considered himself an interviewer, but I think he's become quite a good interviewer and just has, because of his background, has a new, has a different way of, of a different angle of interviewing people. Um, but I'm open to ideas. And if there are people, you know, we, we have a certain set of people that we like to source from on this show. You know, obviously we look to, to Bill Maher a lot and to Rogan a lot and to Peterson a lot and Ben and whatever. Um, I think that gives like a good framework of where like sort of a center, let's like a kind of center right saying America is. Uh, but if you've got new voices that we should be checking out, please, please do let us know. Uh, Teresa says, is there penalty, if there is penalty of perjury, where if you are caught lying in court, there will be consequences. Why can't we have something similar for anyone who is representing themselves as a journalist someone who is expected to investigate and report the facts. So the problem technically there is that you don't wanna start suing people over speech, but you're, the meta problem that you're talking about is that there's a group of people who call themselves journalists who are not journalists, they are activists and everyone knows it, right? No one on MSNBC is a journalist. Chuck Scarborough is not a journalist. I keep calling him Chuck Scarborough. Chuck Scarborough was on NBC News in the 80s. Uh, Joe Scarborough is not a journalist. Chuck Scarborough is probably pretty close to a journalist a long time ago. I'm, is Chuck Scarborough still alive? Can someone Google Chuck Scarborough? Is he still is he still out there? He was he was good on NBC News. If you're in the New York metropolitan area back in the 80s and 90s, um, but yeah, you got to be very careful. This this is one of those things where if you were to change any of the libel and slander laws, he is still alive. Chuck Scarborough still. 80 years old, good for Chuck, he's still alive, that's nice to hear. Um, yeah, if you change some of the laws so that people could be sued more easily for libel or slander, the chilling effect it would have over people's ability to criticize each other and everything else would be really, really tough. So you're asking for a better set of journalists. You're asking for journalists like we had in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And I, I don't know how we get them back. There are a couple people I consider journalists out there. Andy No is a really great journalist. Uh, Ashley St. Clair, who I had in the studio a couple weeks ago, like she's doing really good stuff on the border. Like there are a few people, uh, but you got to find them and you got to keep an eye on them before they start, uh, you know, just slowly dosing you with the propaganda and not the, uh, not the truth. Joe says, did you catch the documentary Quiet on Set about what happened behind the scenes at Nickelodeon during the 1990s and 2000s? Uh, Nickelodeon hired a guy to work on children's TV shows that practically worship John 
uh, John Wayne Gacy, yes, that one. And that wasn't even the worst part. You know, I have not seen it. Um, Brock mentioned it to me the other day. Um, it sounds quite horrible, I guess, in light of now what we know, so many of these studios and how this stuff all operates and everything else, it's all grotesque. And uh, no, I, I have not seen, that's like the type of thing, like I would have no desire really to watch that because I do news and everything else throughout the day. And the idea that at nine o'clock, I'm gonna turn on something like that, as opposed to just watching Seinfeld or basketball or something easy. So I probably will not watch it, but I have no doubt that it's horrible and probably not that shocking. Um, Elizabeth says, what's your go-to date night plans now that you have the boys? It seems like dinner in a movie becomes carry out and streaming while falling asleep. Yeah, we don't have many date nights. Um, we do love Hillstone. Hillstone, which in some places is known as Houston's. I've talked to, about it before. We try to go there maybe once a month, but even that can, can be tough. Um, but fortunately, we both love to cook, uh, hang out in the hot tub, just relax and have some tequila and that, that's good enough for us. We've got a lot of family visiting right now. So right this moment, my brother and sister-in-law and three kids are here. My sister was here with her three kids yesterday with my parents. So we were just doing mad cooking for everybody and pool and all that. Um, but date night is is kind of rare at the moment. But I, I think when they turn two, we'll, we'll start getting them back to a little bit of normalcy. But I'm not complaining. It's, it's all good. Um, Amy B says, what is your favorite Bible story and why? You know, I've been asked this one before and without, I can answer it very simply, it is David versus Goliath. The little guy can beat the big guy. And I love that story because if you believe it to be true, it actually becomes true, right? Like if I didn't believe the little guy could beat the big guy, I don't know how I could do what I do for a living. I don't know how I would have created locals to go against big tech. I don't know how I would talk about fighting the power to the extent that I do, but I actually believe that the little guy can beat the big guy, that there could be this Goliath, whether it's literal Goliath like this, or it's big tech Goliath, and that the little guy with the slingshot like David had, or whether it's a new idea, or uh, decentralized coins or whatever, like the little guy can figure out something to beat the big machine. And if you believe that, and I think it's a fundamental human truth, that not, none of these things are so big, are, none of these things are too big to fail. It's ironic because we have banks that are too big to fail and then we always just make them bigger because that's how the machine operates. But I think you always have a chance as the little guy. And if you really understand that and know that it's not gonna be easy and you gotta go get yours, you know, that, that great speech that Sylvester Stallone gives to his son in, um, in, what was it, was it Balboa or Rocky, the one after Rocky V? What was the one after Rocky? Oh, it was called Rocky Balboa, I think. It was a wonderful movie, years after everyone thought he was gonna wrap that thing up, and then they ended up doing those three Creed movies. But he gives his son this speech, just like, it is not gonna be easy, and you gotta go, and it's a freaking war life, but go, 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 go. Well, if you, if you know in your heart that you're David, you are the little guy, but you can beat the big guy. They're, like It's built into the code that the big guy will not always win, then you got a chance, and that's pretty good. Uh, Rich says, if you were to have a cookout barbecue pool party extravaganza and you could only invite people from locals, who would you invite and what side dish would you like me to bring? <laughs> I see what you did there. I'd make sure Jesse Lee Peterson, Michael Malice, Liz Wheeler, and Dave Rubin would be at the top of my list. Many more to choose from. Glad to be a part of locals growing and looking forward to seeing what's new. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I would lie. I, I, I say this now and again, like I would have, I would love to host like a local party here, but I don't know that that's uh, fully for security purposes and sanity purposes what I can do. In terms of some of the some of the creators that are on locals, I mean, some of my favorite people: Tulsi Gabbard, Scott Adams, Michael Malice, Bridget Fedezi. There's a, there's a whole bunch of great people that are on locals, and of course, you guys more than anything else. It's like the people that support us that allow us to be free and do this. And, uh, and everything else. And uh, I, would, I would cook you a hell of a steak, I, pr I promise you that. I'd bust out the big green egg, I'd get the uh, Japanese A5 Wagyu and make something happen for you. All right, people, that is our show for today. A uh, whole bunch going on, so as I said, no post-game show uh, today, but we will be back tomorrow. A couple surprises coming later in the week. Hang tight, thanks. A lot of you have been talking tonight about these government health care plans that you've proposed in one form or another. This is a show of hands question, and, and hold them up for a moment so people can see. Raise your hand if, gov if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants.